a lot of hackers in this room, but I don't know if you knew that, but, but every being on this planet has a source code. Even your cat, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, and your dog. And the next speaker actually know how to read the source code of human beings, beings uh, the human genome. Anna Müllner is a German medical biotechnologist, and she completed her PhD in cancer research. But she is also a science blogger, podcaster, and science slammer, known under the name Adora Bell. She says something that's quite interesting for me as a privacy activist. She says genome sequencing provides us with opportunities for medical and biological science, but with challenges in ethics and privacy. Please give a round of applause to the next speaker, Adora Bell. Yeah, um, hello and welcome to my talk about genetic codes and what they tell us and everyone else. You might realize it's a little uh, different code than most of you are used to. Um, so at first I'd like to introduce myself to say who I am and how did I get here. Katasha already told you some of that, uh, so I can go quite quickly. I'm a biologist and I did my PhD in cancer research, so I'm always interested about cancer and this talk will have a slight, uh, slight influence by that. Uh, I'm blogging, I'm podcasting, I'm talking about science and slamming about science as well. Um, but what people might actually wonder is how did I actually get here? And you may remember a couple of years ago, um, the Chaos Communication Club, um, Chaos Computer Club, sorry, um, uh, they stole uh, the uh, fingerprint of Wolfgang Schäuble because he wanted to put the fingerprint of each of us on our ID cards. And as you might have realized the last time you renewed your ID card, that actually happened. Um, and at the time, I was in Scotland and I was doing a, um, a, a course in forensics, and that's actually me and, um, at a mock crime scene, so no people were harmed, but I was quite sweaty under the suit, so... Uh, <laughs> and um, I realized that if you take the glass of someone they drinks from and you take the fingerprint, you can also take the genetic fingerprint, and actually um, there's the whole genome of someone on there. Um, so, um, to quickly summarize where you can find genetic information, um, you can find it just about anywhere. You can find it on shed skin cells, in the saliva, in blood, in hair, in urine, in feces, in sperm, in vaginal fluid. Um, and we actually, we spread it all the time. And, um, for example, you have it on your toothbrush, on your hairbrush, uh, on your keyboard, other personal items like your cell phone. It's even on used condoms. And remember, there's probably also the DNA of someone else on there. Um, and uh, also, you have it on other people. So if you scratch someone, you have their DNA. If you lose hair uh, and skin cells, if you touch people, you will transfer some of your genetic information. Um, and uh, also, like I said, with Wolfgang Schäuble on glasses, um, on letters that you lick to close them, on cigarettes that you smoke, and um, also some part of your DNA, and this is quite important, is in your relatives, because you share the genetic information to some extent. So to quickly um, introduce the terms genetic fingerprints, uh, genetic fingerprints actually uh, provide no personal information as such besides the biological gender. That's what you can actually check for, but the other information is nonsense information that will not tell you anything about the person. Uh, but it gives you a positive possibility to find relatives since you share um, these, um, the, these information. And um, it gives you the possibility to re-identify people, and um, it's a unique sequence. 
Um, and if you compare this to a whole genome, which is becoming more common now in, um, in research, you can find the biological gender, of course. You can find the ethnicity of a person. You can look at genetic diseases. You can find out something about the looks of the person. And you can find out things about their relatives as well. And uh, as we do more research, we will find that there will be even more information to come. And similar to the fingerprint, you will be able to re-identify people um, with this unique sequence. And in between the fingerprint and the genome, um, there will be a lot of genetic profiles that have um, some kind of reach, uh, depending on how far you want to look, how deep you want to look. Um, and of course, people said this is uh, quite important information. So um, they said the human genome will actually be a final frontier in biology because it actually it is our source code and this is what makes us us. And um, so they started the human genome project and uh, said if we sequence all this uh, DNA, um, then we will be able to reach kind of the holy grail. And um, they expected 100,000 genes. And um, Bill Gates then said uh, this would be the language in which God created life. Um, so this was kind of a, yeah, um, a major goal that they wanted to do. And then they found out that there are only 19 to 20,000 genes, which is about the same number as nematodes, so that's kind of little worm, um, and four times more than the bacteria in your gut. And um, so the, um, the leader of the project, Craig Venter, uh, whose own genome was sequenced, he then said, we don't know a shit. He, he said, we have no idea what it means. And uh, they said then, well, to find out more, we actually need to sequence more genomes. And this does make sense, because if you want to find answers in the genome, then you have to uh, compare these genomes. And this then led to different projects, which are still going on, like the 1,000 Genomes Project, the 10,000 Autism Genome Project, the 100,000 uh, Genomes Project in the UK, and the 1 million Genomes Project in the US. And there are other genome projects, like for example, the Cancer Genome Project. And these all aim at a kind of personalized medicine. So to compare your DNA and then adjust treatment to your uh, genome. But as I will tell you soon, um, uh, these will not answer all the questions because uh, DNA is much more about uh, the regulation. Um, our DNA um, uh, is regulated in a way that it's more mobile and agile to respond. Our um, Actually, the DNA is quite static, but the re regulation of the DNA actually made, makes it extremely adaptive. And um, then there's another thing, because as I said, um, DNA is a code. Uh, it's similar to your code and code that you do uh, for a program, but then how the user uses this program can vary extremely widely. So um, you will find that uh, even though the, similar, the information is similar in people, it might look different in the person itself. So just to give you a quick impression about how these uh, interactions look like, these are the products of the genome, or, or some of the project, uh, pro, uh, products. Um, they're called proteins, and they interact with each other. Which is, which is, with each other. And um, we will find that they have all these interactions, all these crossroads. One interacts with the next, and this then inhibits something else. And this is quite complex. But still, DNA research does have its uses, so um, it will provide us with valuable information. But what you need to keep in mind is that, uh, is it valuable for whom? So um, it could be used, the whole genome sequencing could soon be used um, instead of specific tests because it's becoming more and more cheaper all the time. And it would give us the possibility to study specific genes in a population, a genetic uh, disease, inherited cancer, and genetic risks. And um, 
So since I'm a cancer researcher, I'm doing a quick uh, X course here. Um, uh, you can study single gene diseases, which are usually then, if you have a mutation, um, and you find this in the genome, the person will have the disease with a very, very high likelihood. There are very rare cases which this does not happen, uh, but these are very rare, these uh, single gene diseases. And um, also, there are some cancer genes. Uh, these are genes that we all have, but if they are mutated, they will very likely lead to cancer in a very, at a very early point in life. And you might remember Angelina Jolie, who found a cancer gene, a gene in her that was, um, uh, that would lead to her having breast cancer very early in life. And so she had her breasts removed. And, um, this also exists for colon cancer, and there are also special syndromes um, which lead to having more or being, um, being more susceptible to cancer. Uh, so these are also rare, actually. Um, but it is very likely that in the Western world, we will die from two major courses. Uh, one is uh, cardiovascular disease, and the other is cancer. And um, when you think about uh, how to not get cancer, um, I always say it is to be boring, so you need to have a healthy lifestyle. Uh, so no smoking, less drinking, staying fit and uh, not eating too much. And uh, avoiding radioactivity also plays a big part. Um, and uh, not to go into the sun without sunscreen and uh, to accept your screening appointments uh, with your doctor. But even then, uh, I always say that cancer is mostly bad luck, which is also the opinion of many cancer researchers. Um, and if you don't get it, it just means that you have not died of something else earlier because it is a disease that comes with age and it gets more um, likely to have this disease as you become older. And Genetic risk factors then play a very little role, actually. Um, so then let's talk about the private genetic sequencing companies that are uh, sprouting up everywhere. You might have heard of uh, 23andMe, um, uh, which is a mail-in genetic test, which tests you for diseases and ethnicity, and they sequence over 500,000 gene locations. Uh, there's a similar company called Ancestry, which just uh, check your ancestry, so, so kind of your ethnicity. And there's the Ingenia.com surname project, which uh, compares your DNA to a male lineage, in the male lineage, with uh, the last name. And also, now we have whole genome sequencing companies like the Full Genomes Corporation, Guardium, Gene by Gene, and even more. And um, you have to uh, realize that these companies will have quite some genetic information stored. And uh, this is all nice and safe since the government in America, where most of these companies are, uh, has repeatedly shown to respect privacy. Um, and of course, that won't change under the new president, I think. Um, so uh, already... Uh, in 2010, Kashmir Hill, an author at Forbes, she wrote an article called Genome Hackers, where she showed a, a lot of foresight. And um, I'm just going to quote here. As gene tests become common, possibilities for abuse will intensify. Banks might not offer your mortgage if you were likely to die before it was paid off. A pregnant woman might secretly get DNA from her lovers so she knows who the father is. Someone might check out a potential mate for genetic flaws. Politicians might dig up dirt on their rivals. Another question, how far should law enforcement be allowed to go? Should prosecutors be allowed to subpoena a company's DNA database of thousands of people if they suspect it contains a match to a crime suspect? And... Um, then a year later, uh, Robert Langrath, he referred to this article and then said, I think this issue is just starting to emerge. It will be a classic conflict between scientists' desire for more data and Americans' desire to keep sensitive per uh, personal information private. If your DNA is an easily accessible database, what are the limits of what bureaucrats can do with it?
And what I find quite interesting here is that he just makes this between scientists and privacy-oriented Americans. Uh, when we think about it today, it might be even more like uh, companies and people who don't really think about privacy. And um, then uh, we come a little year, uh, a couple of years later, and actually this is... Uh, what then happens. So 23andMe and Ancestry were repeatedly asked by uh, law enforcement to hand over DNA databases and they actually disclosed that they have five um, DNA samples that they gave to the cops. Um, and uh, so one uh, case, for example, uh, which was not 23andMe, but um, that's a, a filmmaker and uh, there was a cold case and there was uh, DNA on a, the murder victim and they compared it to a voluntary Y chromosome database search, so a male lineage search, and they found out that uh, the DNA uh, on the murder victim belonged to someone who was related to someone in this database. And uh, that someone actually had a son, so they said, um, well, then we test him. And uh, so they uh, found filmmaker Azri and they tested him. However, the complete DNA then did not match and uh, he was cleared of the charge. And um, a statement by the privacy officer of 23andMe kind of shows what uh, we are getting into because she said, in the event we are required by law to make a disclosure, we will notify the affected customer through the contact information provided to us, unless doing so would violate the law of a court order. So if your DNA becomes interesting in a crime case, they might tell you, but they might also not tell you. Um, and of course, then there's this, I've got nothing to hide and the suspect was cleared, so um, it will all be in order after all. Just always remember that there can be planted evidence because as I said, you shed your DNA everywhere and uh, it's quite easy to obtain your genetic information and place it at a, at a crime scene, which might at least lead to confusion. And um, there could be circumstantial evidence so that a crime happens somewhere where you're uh, working or where, you, where you're often. And uh, always remember the Heilbronn phantom case uh, where they found uh, the DNA of a woman at completely unconnected crime cases. And uh, this uh, DNA was later um, later found in the swabs that they used to test the evidence uh, because the lady who had produced these swabs had contaminated the swabs. And um, as you might remember, this led to a lot of confusion in, uh, in the research uh, or in the cri uh, criminal investigation. And uh, if you think that data is the new oil, it truly is for companies like 23andMe who have reportedly sold genetic data to private companies. Um, and this was, uh, of course, for research. And uh, they did it uh, with 1.2 million genetic profiles that they have in their database uh, for Parkinson research. And there seem to be more deals planned. And Anne Wojcicki of the... Um, of 23andMe, she said that she wants the whole world's healthcare data accessible to everyone. And um, uh, of course they do have a consent form and this is signed by about 80% of customers, uh, which probably think, well, if, uh, if I can help with my DNA to do some research, uh, that's fine. So, uh, but do they really know what they're getting into? And this is why I would like to come to genetic sequencing privacy. And um, if we talk about privacy, we have to think about for whom is a genome interesting. Um, since uh, rem the 23andMe test, for example, is a mail-in test, so you could send in the DNA of someone else, and uh, then you could test someone else on their genes. And this could be a prospective partner if they have good DNA uh, to have offspring with maybe or uh, might die early or might die late. Um, family members, uh, if you want to know if your son is really your son, your daughter is really your daughter, um, test for paternity and uh, maybe if you want to know if you were adopted. 
uh, insurance companies might be quite interested in this data. Employers could be interested and prospective parents could be interested because you can test from just one cell the genome um, of an embryo, for example. And who knows who might else be interested once more information becomes accessible. And uh, the price is quite cheap, actually, to do the genetic test with 23andMe is $200. Uh, the price of a whole genome is now below 1,000 uh, US dollars, and the price will decrease further. Um, so we could be, should be quite weary about what's going on. Uh, because, for example, 23andMe um, blogs completely openly about what they do, and they connected a man to his biological father. Um, but this was not uh, because his father had entered his DNA in the database. It was because his cousin had. So um, someone put, got tested by 23andMe. 23andMe said, well, here's your cousin. And then he found out that, this, uh, that there could be his father that he had been looking for. And uh, quite interestingly, it could be faith. So there's an African-American woman who was always interested in the Jewish faith and then found out via 23andMe that is, she is related to the Ashkenazi Jewish um, tr tribe. Um, and um, today this information is, uh, well, just information. It doesn't really matter to us. But just remember if this information had been available 70, 80 years earlier. And... Uh, a similar example could be Indian castes. Uh, so the caste system in India is outlawed, but uh, if you're uh, still a traditionalist there, uh, you could test people to which caste they belong to and discriminate against them. And then there's another, um, another uh, case that just happened this year uh, where there are plans of testing uh, genetic uh, gene testing at the Kuwaiti border. Uh, and they say, of course, this is anti-terrorism, which does not really make sense because you need some DNA to uh, compare and to find terrorism and uh, terrorists. There is no terror gene. And um, what could be uh, the real reason could be to keep out, non uh, out non kuwaitis because they have nomads like Bedouins that they don't really like. And... Um, that uh, they could also test family members and then put them under pressure if they might have a le an illeg illegitimate child or if their wife has been unfaithful, just to put on um, some, yeah, some kind of bad information about them. And uh, when I was doing research for the talk, I found um, quite interesting um, that a blogger had his whole genome sequence and he got a hard drive from Illumina. And this hard drive was actually encrypted and was in tr uh, encrypted by TrueCrypt. So this was two years ago. Uh, we now know that this might have not been completely safe. And uh, But we also have to take, uh, yeah, uh, take up that genetic data can be useful, but we have to have this compromise because it can be misused. And um, since it does have relevance in research, there are, um, there's a large amount of genome stored for research purposes at many institutes. And David Goldstein said at the Institute of uh, Genome Medicine at Columbia University that there is an irreversible drive toward obtaining more and more complete genetic information. And we are all going to be sequenced. The question is just who does it and what is done with it. The challenge will be to do good things with the data. And if you want to do good things, you have to share the data and the genomes need to be compared and their data size is a problem because genomes can be extremely large and um, depending on the coverage of the data and uh, of the genome. And there's about 200 uh, terabytes stored in Amazon Cloud for the 1000 Genome Project. And there's also now Google Genomics, which wants to help you with the big data of genomes. And is that worth it? Well, maybe genome research can be worth it for uh, specific purposes during research and to adjust treatment of diseases, which works to a point, um, but also uh, in forensics. But then we have to make up which limits. And um, 
For the individu individual person, genetic tests are probably not necessary unless your doctor advises you to. And um, you have to wonder if your ancestry really matters that much to you. And uh, always keep in mind that this is not just your information. It's also the information of your relatives. And uh, do you really want to know what the test tells you? Does it, if it comes up with a genetic disease that cannot be treated, do you want to know? And also, if the DNA gets out there, if your genetic information is disclosed and you're connected to it, you cannot change your DNA. It will always be the same and you can always be recognized by it. So uh, I'd like to thank you for all for your attention and I hope you have some questions for me. <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk. Um, we have six microphones here on the ground floor. So if you want to, um, if you have a question, um, you can line up there and we still have some time left. There was one question at number one. Yeah, thank you for your talk and for the information. No, uh, <laughs> number one. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. So, um, you were talking about this problem with people wanting to share their, um, their genetic sequence for science, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. on the other side, you have the problem that the scope of that is not mm -hmm. obvious. Um, mm -hmm. Could you solve that by like, putting everything into public domain? Um, public domain of all genomes. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just that a That would thought. be kind of the post-privacy approach that you all hold, or that the genomes of the world are all in public domain, like uh, this Columbia uh, professor said, maybe. Um, well, that's not really solving. That's just saying, okay, if we have the information of everyone awa available, then no one can be discriminated against because there's dirt on anyone, maybe. But... Uh, I don't know if that's the correct way, because we have to make a decision for seven, eight billion people in the world. So, Thank you for this question. We have um, also some questions from the internet. As you don't want to give genetic information to corporations and government, is it possible to, to do the test at home? And how much would it cost? Um, so the testing of the DNA is done with 23andMe, but you can do the, um, you can disagree to share the information. Um, so, and then you'd ha have to hope that they do it as, like such, uh, or as such. But that doesn't really know, but then I don't know if it might uh, still come up for a police uh, investigation still. So doing it at home would be quite, uh, yeah, difficult because the sequencing machines are very, uh, yeah, cost, uh, ex uh, or very costly and very difficult to use. But there was talk about doing it with a smartphone to have a, just a tiny device who does this for you. Um, but I have not heard that this is now accessible yet. Another question from number three. Hi, uh, from your expert point of view, have you been thinking of or are you in a database for a bone marrow donations and what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I actually am and I did this when I was 16 and wasn't really thinking about it. Um, I think now that uh, this is... Uh, they, they will probably not take your whole genome, but they do have some information on me stored and they might even have the probe still stored. like. Um, the blood that I gave at, the, at that point. Um, so they could still be doing, um, if they were uh, criminals, just uh, test my genome for that. So yes, but I am in the database and also a blood donor. So my blood is somewhere out there uh, all the time. Um, and have yes. you been thinking of revoking it? Like maybe you can revoke your database entry? Um, I think I could. But for this, uh, as long as I don't know that they actually take my genome out of it, as long as they just store the information on my, um, yeah, my 
uh, major historicability complex. <laughs> um, so that's what they what they look at, but they look at it genetically. Um, I just hope to do some good, but uh, yeah, you're you're right. They pro they probably don't have my whole genome as such as information, but they do have some genetic information, and they do have my probe stored. So, thank you for this question. Um, there was another question from the internet. Do you think these kind of studies are already carried out secretly from our samples we give to health care orgs, just like blood giving? Well, well, if they do it secretly, then I don't probably don't know about it. But um, uh, so that's quite difficult to answer. But it could be possible, especially in uh, in regimes where uh, there's no democracy, for example. Um, and uh, but I, I'm not sure if this happens because uh, I don't have that kind of information. <laughs> So, another question from number two. Um, hello. Mm -hmm. I think there was a project uh, that uh, uh, instead of uh, working with a lot of different uh, um, genome sequence, uh, try to work with a single uh, sequence and branching for, basically branching the little differences for, mm -hmm. uh, for everybody. Would mm -hmm. that solve the, the, privacy, the privacy problems a bit? To just look at the differences to other or, genomes? Yeah, or would that yeah. impair, I don't know, the research and, and stuff? Well, this, uh, so there is a format that just checks for uh, differences in the genome, which is, gives you a much smaller data size. So you have your common genome and then you have the um, data size, uh, the, just what the delta of it. And, uh, but this will actually just give everything that is not, um, well, not normal, so as a um, probability term, uh, than, your, than your DNA. So it's actually more condensed information of what makes you, uh, your genetic code, your genetic code. So that's not really helping with the privacy. So, so you, still, uh, yeah. uh, you can still identify the, the yeah. single person. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, that was unfortunately the last question because we are running out of time. The next talk is waiting. Uh, please give again a warm applause to Adora Bell.